Hey everybody, I'm Jody Vance. And I'm George Affleck. And it is time for Unspun Sanitary. <laughs> hey, this we is are uh, I got bacterial this, free. I know I got this from a um, from a, a, a it's a hand sanitizer, juniper and citrus, and it smells like gin. <laughs> It's uh, it's quite cool. It's, mm. We it's like gin. Real gin, yeah. It's from uh, the Long Table Distillery. They're selling this in uh, Yale Town and uh, or Beach Beach Side Beach Village, whatever it's called. Yeah. Juniper and Sister. It's just, but basically, it smells like I, I had a whole bunch of gin poured on my hands. So, which is not a bad thing, you know. In uh, well, we're staying here trapped in our worlds. Long Table. That they're the ones that changed their distillery to actually be making that sanitizer, right? They, they're, yeah, they're brewing, uh, uh, distilling uh, some of it for, uh, they're also selling gin. I wasn't of course. a nice bottle of gin, but they were also uh, selling this and it was, and given the situation, it's not official, you're not allowed to sell it officially, but it does, um, right. well, no, cause it, it, it's nice, it smells nice. It's so anyways, I'm sanitized. You've been sanitized. Good, good. Uh, lots to uh, unpack this week on Unspun Podcast. A lot of COVID-19 um, material to look at. And it's interesting how we've all sort of, I don't know, somewhat normalized this conversation in early days. Uh, what are we, 43 days ago when we were starting to talk on this subject matter? Okay. And now it feels like, okay, we're just reaching back into the file and looking at what we, you know, where have we, where have we come from? Doesn't doesn't Christmas 2019 feel like 15 years ago? <laughs> the new normal sucks, but uh, we're getting used to it for sure. And yeah, uh, to a certain degree. But yeah, I think Christmas seems like a million years ago, a year, and the next Christmas seems like a million years away as well. Yeah, but we're going to get through this together. And that really is uh, at the root of things here. This too shall pass. Uh, it's how we navigate our way through. I think in, in talking politics in a pandemic, we have to be a little bit careful in that it doesn't smack as partisan politics because we're really not fighting against the man here uh, or the machine. We're just talking it through. Uh, we see Justin Trudeau, our prime minister, each and every morning, 815. He steps out in, in front of the front door of his cottage and gives the latest update on how many hundreds of millions or billions of dollars he will be spending on various sectors. And as of today, the Thursday that we are recording this, um, what is it, the 24th? Thursday, the 23rd of uh, day, April. Day, days There's, don't matter. Days don't matter anymore. Day, Sunday? day. Is it Sunday? Is it Wednesday? No. Thursday? None of, none of us know. No. Actually, you should make note on Sundays because I am now uh, hosting the two to four show on Sundays. Uh, which is a COVID-19 special on CKNW, and I'll do that ongoing until there's no more COVID-19 special on CKNW from two well, to four on Sundays. You. That's awesome, but I also look forward to you getting fired from that job. <laughs> uh, right. I'll be, I'll be all right when they say, you know what, everybody's good okay. and we're all going back to normal, yeah. uh, back to the regular scheduled program. Let's talk about what Justin Trudeau was uh, announcing on this day. Um, $1.1 billion for research, vaccine research, for research um, development, Clinical trials and distrib distribution here in Canada. That's a big announcement. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think that that's one of the things that is we need to, to solve this problem is, is not only a vaccine, but also solutions for everything, treatment and communications and manufacturing. This is something Bill Gates has been very, very vocal about. Uh, I think he's funding 10 facilities or something like that. To seven. Seven, yes. seven facilities to be prepped, building them, billions of dollars to cost even if they're not the ones that are chosen to manufacture uh, the actual, uh, you know, cure to this. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's sort of counterintuitive to start building, um, you know, factories and, and, and tooling equipment when you haven't got anything to produce yet. But uh, I think that's kind of where Trudeau was going today. We need to just fund this stuff and just, just because if we don't, we'll never get to the end of this. Um, I just, what interests me is though, why are, it doesn't seem like there's a really coordinated approach. Every country seems to be doing their own thing, funding their own programs. Universities are all kind of fighting for it. There's two concerns. One is like, does that not slow down the, the process of, of the science? But also whoever wins this, and if you've seen the movie Contagion, uh, there's parts of that movie with Matt Damon, where they talk about whoever gets to the cure fastest um, will make the most money. Um, and because they will develop the drug and they will be able to control the supply and demand and all those things, the price and and so I wonder if that is part of this. I, we're all competing. Every country's competing uh, to get to the vaccine, obviously for selfish reasons for our own residents in this country, 
Um, but if it's being co-developed with independent private sector, which most of these are, um, then that provides them with an opportunity to make a lot of money and nothing wrong with that. But, but it seems like uh, all these different scientists all around the world, I know they're communicating, but it, it just, I just wonder if they, on the science side, if we just speed this up, is there not a better way? I don't know, I'm not a scientist. George, can you imagine the conspiracy theories that will um, oh God. explode if China is the country that comes up with the vaccine or the antiviral for this? Or will they even tell us if they have a vaccine? <laughs> I mean, well, they stand to make a whole bunch of dough, probably. I mean, but it also gives them a lot of power if they have a vaccine. Yeah. If a country gets the vaccine first and doesn't share it, and then they are immune, that's an interesting challenge. I can't see it happening. It would be very. I bad, hope very, we're beyond that. Very bad public relations for that country, um, and and a, really a declaration of coming war. And what's the point of being the richest country in the world with nobody to compete with because everybody's isolated or dead? Like. That's just, well, yeah. Contag don't watch Contagion, people. I did not watch Contagion. I love Matt Damon, but I'm not interested in that being a reality. I, d I did have Dr. Peter Hotez, who I mentioned I on the podcast. To, just one moment, before, Matt Damon, it, I just read an article, he's stuck in Ireland. Did you know that? He's, no. he's there filming a movie and he's been stuck there with his family since like the, be the beginning of this. He decided he lives in Brooklyn. He decided not to go back because- uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. And uh, he's got like 5 million kids. So yeah. they're living in Ireland and he's like this, you know, this small town in his village and, and he's just kind of, he's there, they have this two, two kilometer distance thing where they're not allowed to, I don't know, they get some really strict rules in Ireland, but he's still there living his life. But it's interesting because obviously the village has got, hey, the guy from Contagion lives in our town. The guy who was actually had immunity and Contagion is living in our town. Oh, you know, giveaway on that one. But anyways, I just thought it was interesting. I'm he, not going to watch it. Yeah, he, It's he was, number like, one on the Netflix. I'm not going to watch it. Yeah, But he's living in this town because he chose not to, uh, to, you know, move his family back home to where all the challenges are and he's living in this village in a, in a remote place. Um, anyways, I, I digress, but I- No, but I, I think it's important because it actually ties quite nicely into the next note, which is what I've been trying to say to my parents for the last, uh, I don't know, two months. Stop watching US cable news. Doesn't matter which one, just stop it because we're not them. Things work differently here. Very, 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 proud and excited and glad and relieved to be Canadian, never more so now. Yep. Um, but talking to Peter Hotez, Professor Hotez, who is a vaccinologist and a pediatrician, like I've spoken with him for yeah. years about vaccines. Mm -hmm. He's in rare and infectious um, tropical disease And you, study. by the way, were an aggressive pro-vaxxer. <laughs> I am. I've known you. Yes. Uh, and take on these anti-vaxxers uh, in a big way over the last, you've written columns about it. Even, so. I have. I, I take them on. Boy, they love to fill up my inbox. <laughs> uh, but that's okay, because I can take it. Um, but in talking with Dr. Hotez, he right this second, he's the guy who started putting out the, the concept of one of his colleagues, who's out of New York, about the uh, convalescent antibody treatment that is like from 1918. It's taking plasma from somebody who's recovered from the virus, spinning out the antibodies that build up to fight it, taking those antibodies and put injecting them into somebody who might be a frontline healthcare worker or somebody who's at death's door. It might be just the thing to help lower the mortality rate. Um, and so he, his colleague in, in New York, I believe, um, and he were talking about doing this. They've been on multiple um, platforms and just sort of getting it out of, until we have a vaccine. Can we not look at doing this in the United States? There was a huge sort of about doing it because it's costly. You have to set up blood banks. People need to come in. You need to actually take the blood. Then you need to spin the blood. You need to give the red blood cells back to the person you took them from. Then you got to take that. And who gets the serum and da 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 da. Mm -hmm. Well, Canadians took that on. We, in every major uh, research lab across, at every university across the country, people are like, the scientists are, as you were saying, on one page, working together, not in silos, trying to figure it out with the convalescent antibody study. So there's Dr. Hotez actually, over the course of six, eight weeks, got that message out, and it's actually helping. Like, I really believe that he um, has a lot to do with that. And then the last time we spoke on Sunday, he's like, we actually have a COVID-19 a, he calls it SARS uh, CoV C CO2 um, because SARS one and this is SAR this is basically SARS two. It's kind of like mm -hmm. HIV and AIDS. The difference between what the what the actual virus is called and what the you know the d the disease is or the seriousness of the. Anyways, he's taught me a lot. You got to follow Dr. Hotez. And yeah. he said we actually have a vaccine ready to go to clinical trial, but we can't 
we have to raise the money to do that first. Oh. We have to raise $5 million. I'm like, $5 million? Jeff Bezos sneezes $5 million. Like He doesn't actually. <laughs> He, no, he, he wouldn't give any of his money away. It doesn't. But okay, where's Michael Bloomberg? We see Bill Gates. You've mentioned him. Like, how is it that Dr. Hotez can't get five million dollars from the government? I mean, Justin Trudeau just handed out one point one billion dollars to Canadian researchers. That's the difference. One of the many differences between us and the U.S. Um, and I really hope that Dr. Hotez, he's kind of got a fund me on his on his Twitter page a, a link to where you can find out how to help if you've got i don't know well, in vancouver i heard from somebody who's quite well known for its ability to find discover, discover uh its science side on the on the on the cam discoveries of, of of different strains of, of breakthroughs yeah. Uh, yeah breakthroughs i didn't know that yeah. recently i was surprised to hear that but we have a lot of amazing labs a lot of them private totally of them universities doing some amazing work so it's uh one of the greatest cool alzheimer's clinics is here uh one of the greatest breast cancer research clinics here um like just cutting edge cutting edge researchers and some of the greatest minds because let's face it we're the greatest country in the world to live in um so interesting though to think that that there's a struggle to get what could be a vaccine that could work into clinical trials to find out efficacy and, and safety and mm -hmm. and then to get to that next level of of developing and and then um distributing because it's going to be like that's when we really need bill gates and his seven um, <laughs> structures that he's building. A um, couple other things I want to talk about it with regard to Justin Trudeau and the, and the announcements today and yesterday and last week and a month ago. Um, small business is still a struggle, right? In the U.S., you see those big companies that that scooped up all the loan money. <laughs> Ruth's Chris Steakhouse really needs that twenty million dollars. <laughs> Yeah, we had got initially we had that ten percent on the payroll, which was great, really simple to to as a small business owner myself, uh, which was great. It's a few thousand bucks over a couple of months for me. Um, yeah. And then there's the seventy five percent thing, but really then you have to meet this thirty percent threshold of revenue down. Um, and a lot of companies, it's still too soon to say that year over year. Um, and even the application process has just started. Really, it's just even getting going. So nobody's benefited from that yet. And if you own a business, okay. you know how the biggest challenge you have is cash flow. Um, it's not about, um, you know, uh, necessarily, you know, clients or what you, your overall revenue was because you, in your, on my books, it might say I made a billion dollars or whatever, but I've only received 500 million of it. I'll, I'm, not, I'm not making that kind of money. Uh, but you know, you, it's where the money's coming from. And obviously right now, so many, uh, businesses, especially, um, you know, not necessarily retail and, um, restaurants because their revenue stops right away and their everything stopped. Whereas businesses in the services sector like mine or lawyers or, or, you know, different supply companies, so they're not getting their cash. People are paying their bills. Um, and they're not, so they're missing the cash that's to come to them. Um, and so right. they just need a way to get through this period of time, uh, to reduce their, uh, you know, costs so they can cover their basic, um, uh, you know, things that they need, like staffing. And so it's frustrating. Any relief on your rent? Because you're not using that space, right? Do you get Yeah, we've been out of there for six weeks. And I know my rent, my own, the owners of the building have said, too bad. They said they offered to defer the rent, which is okay, it's fine. But they're not offering anything, you know, special. But right? deferring the rent, you still got to pay it. I'm still not, I still haven't gotten things started with my bank on the mortgage deferral, by the way. Oh, my yeah. God. But I they sent me a survey. I gave them the zero 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 on the survey. We'll see if that gets me a phone call. I know but it's, crazy. it's in the business, and the city has done nothing for business yet. There's nothing Let's, they've provided. No, 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 you know nothing. And there's some finger pointing starting to go on, though, right? Is there ever? It's right. You know, we We're have, at that point. Well, we started with the mayor a few weeks ago, and I was pretty aggressive about that. I think you know, it's this is the time. We're still in a healthcare crisis. Uh, each level of government, as I pointed out, is dealing with their own financial challenges in order to deal with a health crisis this is no time to be either even begging or trying to extort money like the mayor did out of the out of the fear mongering <laughs> yeah fear mongering uh what appeared to be basically incompetency uh, of how to run the city uh not understanding how cash comes in and what a balance sheet is um you know i think that the time right now is you need to focus on your own government you know hunker down and say what can we do whether you're the province, the federal government, or the cities, 
obviously the provinces are in charge of the healthcare. That's their job. That's their sector. That housing and healthcare. These are two important aspects that the province needs to deal with. Cities are in charge of other stuff, roads and, and other things. So when the mayor or any city says they don't have enough money, you got to find a solution of your, how you're going to deal with that. And, and the mayor this week and the $200 million he asked for, he's getting some heat from the mayor of Edmonton, Don Iverson, uh, you know, saying, whoa, whoa, buddy, we all need some cash, you know, get your house in order and then call back. You know what, but the Iveson was saying, like, cause he did a video like this from home uh, saying, you know, we need the help from the federal government as well. We need, and I'm yeah. like, do you guys not know how to pick up a phone? Can you stop doing this at press conferences to freak out every citizen in the country that's laid off, lost their job behind on their rent, can't afford food, you know, are struggling to figure yeah. out the dynamic of what's going on. And these guys, are, I, I and I get it. It's stressful for everybody, and politicians are finding their way through this. But can you just call up the feds instead of doing it in front of a camera and putting the it out there? The mayor of Vancouver was always talking about this. Mayor Kennedy Stewart, his big thing was, I am the chief lobbyist for Vancouver. Well, you know, I understand lobbying a little bit, and generally you don't threaten. It's not a really effective way uh, to lobby. You really don't get what you want if you make threats to the government uh, above you. Uh, that actually have control over you in, in the case of municipal governments who work at the pleasure, uh, as painful as that is, if they're an appendage of the provinces. Yeah. Um, they really, uh, so they're, 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 that is annoying on one hand, but it makes them somewhat secure in that they will, the province will have to deal with it if the, if the cities themselves can't handle it, which clearly this mayor in Vancouver is over his head, you know, uh, is drowning in, in, in his under, lack of knowledge of how to run a city. So, the, the, the request to, to the province of 200 million has basically burned our chief lobbyist uh, forever now with this, with this government, a government who he's aligned with politically. And now they're making a mockery of him, really. They've said, they, they, the comments they make, they've even said, said that they don't understand why cities like Vancouver are you know, being so strict on things like uh, you know, parks and uh, places where people can, can get hang out as long as they keep their distance. Um, it, it, it really is this, this bit of a battle now going on between the other levels of government. And I think we've seen a bit of it from Trudeau a little bit. We've seen a bit, we see a bit of it in Ontario. We see the mayor of, of Toronto being quite hardcore, um, you know, and it's also, I, I worry that there's this shame factor going on out there. There's this, people are starting to get angry at each other a little bit. And I think it's coming from, if your leaders are starting to be snipey uh, yeah. and, and asking for too much and being too, creating too much of a police state, then you you create this culture of divisiveness and it's worrying. It is worrying, George, and, and a couple things I wanna ask you about. First of all, just for our listeners' sake or our viewers' sake in terms of what he threatened, what was the threat that our chief lobbyist uh, put forward to the provincial government? Well, I mean, he didn't. He said we would be insolvent if we didn't get 200 million you know, cash money, not a, not a loan. He said, I think yesterday, I don't need a loan, uh, I need cash, basically. Uh, you know, I think the city of Vancouver, the money. you know, like a business, we all, as a business owner and any business owner who's going, okay, cash flow is going to wherever it's going to zero or it's going to some number. So I need to deal with expenses. Uh, how do I, what are the things that I can do in order to get to get through this? And right. you, every business looks at their own scenario differently and you make your decisions based on a whole bunch of factors, you know? So okay, what, how about I'll, they I'll make it? that subscription? I'll, I'll, I'll lay off these three people, I'll, whatever it might be. I didn't that get the sense that the mayor or the city of Vancouver have done that. I think right now is an opportunity to kind of just go hardcore. Just, we know that this is going to end at some point. We know that the, the revenue coming in is almost like zip. Doo -doo -doo. Nobody's got really a ton of people aren't out there getting permits. Staff have now had time probably to catch up on a lot of stuff. So why not just shut her down? It's about a million and a half a day in savings. There are some challenges with the unions where you have to wait 75% and you only save 25%. But if the challenge is to save $100 million, how do you do that, Mr. Mayor? That's the, each city has to go, how do I say, I, I need 100 million bucks. Okay, if it's a million and a half a day uh, to shut down, then you're looking at two months in, to get to 100 million. So two months, if we'd started three weeks ago, we'd be getting closer to that um, by two. I know it's painful, and I'm not saying you, you know don't have the police and don't have uh, you know critical key key people. Right, you um, need sanitation. You need sanitation. To pick up the garbage. Or, and yeah. departments that are revenue makers, parking staff. It's actually a money maker for the city. Parking actually makes right. us money. Uh, it's a it's a good ROI on that. So, I think that the cities should, if they have 
financial cash flow challenges. You have to make tough decisions for the short period while we're all still stuck in our homes. Because if they don't do it now and they don't deal with their financial things, when we get out of this crisis, they're going to be, a, when we need them, when we need to go and get my permit, there's not going to be any staff because they can't afford you gotta it. you got to cut back then. Cutting back then doesn't make sense. I think this is a brilliant idea, George. And it was just you and I noodling prior to uh, hitting record here on our Zoom conference call. I think you've... Uh, I think you're onto something here that, that could be a real impactful plan that if put in place strategically could really benefit the city of Vancouver. It just, cause as you've said so many times on this podcast, we're a very different entity versus I, I heard uh, uh, Brad West, I still love mentioning Brad, um, but I heard him speaking about, you know, when he talks about Port Coquitlam, he understands and acknowledges that Port Coquitlam is very different than the city of Vancouver when it comes to the, the scale, just the other. scale. He yeah. was just saying the scale of management is just very different. The charter is different. I think he was trying to be very respectful because he was being very much, I've, I've done it, held as an example of how, why can't we be more like Brad? Um, so I think what you're suggesting could put us in a position where it doesn't just all carry on as this enormous bubble of cost that at the end of this is just handed to the taxpayer as a, here you go fix this but and you know like, yeah and i would well, say you lead now lead now lead now yeah but he obviously needs to get the will of the council um right you have a left-leaning council uh i would say that uh this the unions wouldn't be very happy with my idea um and i would say they would probably fight against it so if you have a left-leaning pro-union council which we have uh and a mayor um i'm i think we're seeing what we're seeing partly because of that so you but is what? there some middle ground? I'm sorry, mushy, middly me. But is there some middle ground on that? Would the union uh, bosses and the and the and the councillors who lean left not identify and acknowledge the fact that we're in a pandemic, man? Like this well, is not that John anything. The union bosses and tell them to tweet what they would do. If, what's their solution? Right. Give uh, us something to do. Unions, you know, tell That's us, a great idea too. Are, are you willing to say to your to your union members? You know what? We need to. But take it, you know, take a couple months off and we all have yeah. to, we're in this together. You know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think there's obviously other stuff going on behind the scenes at the city of Vancouver. I right. know that senior staff are trying to find solutions, but of course, we've now gone six weeks in isolation now. And uh, we have, you know, the city is, you know, laid off 2,500 people now, I think. Um, and most of them are still receiving about 75% of their salaries. Uh, and they will for, I think it's nine weeks uh, yeah. the time they're laid off. So, um, you know, at some point there has to be, and there are 10,000 total around approximately 10 stats at the city of Vancouver. So, right. um, and every city has, as Brad West has mentioned, has a different scenario. And each city has to look at this differently. Burnaby doesn't have the same challenges because they saved a lot of money in their times when times were good. Um, so Vancouver did not. So here we are. Um, so the South China Morning Post, you, you read Ian Young, right? I love Ian Young. A columnist uh, or, or journalist who is um, the Vancouver Bureau for the South China Mor Morning Post. Yep. Um, if you don't follow him on Twitter, I highly recommend that you do. He was ahead of this story. He was ahead of um, the COVID-19 story by leaps and bounds. And it's, he's a fascinating uh, individual, but he just posted something about his parent company um, doing what you basically just explained there to some degree. The South China Morning Post has basically publicly said, we've told all of our executives they're taking an uh, effective immediately a 25% pay cut. All of our uh, full-time employees who make over a certain benchmark will have to accept taking a three week mandatory unpaid, three weeks of unpaid leave between now and May of next year. And basically what they did is they announced this publicly and said, we've done the math. And in order to be strong when this is over, these are the cost saving measures we need to take right now. And I, I, I get that because I think the city of Vancouver if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was the city of Vancouver was talking about, you know, how there's going to be a 10% reduction in like every 10 days, or was it once a month that people need to take one unpaid day? There's like, yeah, they're, there's all, some, they're all taking one day per week right now. The, one actually. day a week. There you go. Okay. So sorry. I've got all of, all of my, I'm not sure if that's all staff or just senior level. I'm not sure how that, how that flows through the, through the, the company, but, um, Again, it's like, okay, I know it's great to get the Richard Street uh, bike lane finished and they're continuing to work on it, but, you know, maybe we could wait uh, three months and just start that up back up in three months. Uh, you know, and other, other projects, if there are priority safety, pro I know it's a good time when the streets yeah. are quiet, 
Yeah. Uh, although I actually don't think they're that quiet anymore. I know Francis Villas tweeted this and I went to my office to pick up some stuff yesterday and it was like business as usual in the neighborhood. Two weeks ago yeah. when I went to my office, I was the only car on Broadway. It was freaky. It was like weird. Now it's like traffic's everywhere. People are starting to come out a little bit more, but they are so also um, wearing masks or very aware of social distancing. And as yeah. you said before, like the difference between what the city has been saying about playgrounds and basketball courts and tennis courts and golf courses all and all that. Yeah. Um, versus what Bo Dr. Bonnie Henry is saying, who's the one that is putting the restrictions on the province, like, as you said, she's in charge of that. Of all the power. She didn't say shut it all down. She, every single day, she says, go outside with your family, we in your bubble, awesome. go be active, go do, like, how can you be active when you're living in a, in a downtown area if you can't go to the park that's got the basketball courts and the playground? Like, how, can, how is tennis? How is tennis a problem? I don't. I, I don't understand I it either. It. It's I literally am fifty feet away from the other person. Uh, I think that should be the first sport to come back. I'd love to see Roger Federer chase after his own balls. Yeah, there we go. I know that, and I've heard the the baseball. Uh, they're in South Korea. No, I, I thought the American league was. They're they're testing all the players to see who's. How oh, are they? I've heard that somebody told me that today. I believe you. They I want believe to bring you. Back, they want to bring back the sport. Baseball obviously is fairly, and I heard the conversation today with uh, Keith Baldry and Mike Smith on Mike Smith's new show um, about, you know, kids' baseball. You know, there's yeah. not a lot of touching going on in baseball, uh, no. especially really bad at it. Um, and uh, My son is jazzed at the idea of Little League returning. And, you know, like, let's, let's get them active and get them out there. And if anybody – I think the biggest takeaway from this first six weeks is just how – not just how – horribly, horribly we uh, were uh, washing our hands, but the fact that most of us went to work sick and now we just wouldn't even consider it. Even if we had the sniffles in the minus, most minor way, we would not leave the house. Like that's a good lesson. And I think little league can happen because there's not going to be the kid that threw up last night and was coughing and sneezing this morning, just suck it up soldier and get out there and pitch. Yeah, you might need to change some of the rules that where there might be contact. I mean, no, right. You know, bases, you have to kind of, I don't know, I, mean, I don't know about baseball. But, you know, I think there's ways around this. I, and I think just in general for us, I don't mind not getting my hair cut. As you see it get longer, pretty soon it'll be like out to here. Yeah. Um, but I, as soon as they ease up restrictions, I can cut your hair for you. I just cut Brian's. It went really well. But I, know, I, I, I could care less about, you know, my hair growing long. But I do need to have uh, exercise. And I need yes. to get up there. And I do continue to run. Uh, and Me too. I'm very cautious about it. And uh, my, we live in a, I'm lucky I live in a sort of a, communal area here downtown where we have 10 townhouses and they have, we all share a communal space outside and there's a volleyball court and it's sort of a nice area so and but we're all all of us 10 neighbors every night because it, i think we'd go crazy if we didn't come out of our houses where we're all working yeah and, we'd sit and have a glass of wine at you know wine time at around 5 30 and we all sit six feet apart outside and yes yeah. we're chilly um but and and we talk about life and we talk and we're not looking at video screens and we're talking to each other and laughing and think and you know socializing safely and and you know i've had a couple of people walk by and go hey what are you guys are too close You're, oh my god come on like seriously we're outside we're at least six feet apart right. Bo bonnie and dr bonnie henry has said that that's not a problem that there's no evidence that that kind of closeness outside that distance has is is a problem you know what the the person who's shaming there is because bonnie henry is very specific to when you are going out and you're saying you're staying six feet apart she's like keep it to those who just live in your house so yeah one echo you're one echo away from the stringent strictness of what is is being suggested by dr bonnie henry but you're being smart about it you know you're not like okay guys we we'll just don't tell anybody, but we're going to grab the soccer ball and we're going to go run around at the field in a pack and like knock each other down and breathe on each other. Like there's, there are varying degrees of breaking the rules. And it's for, for me, again, my, my mom was a scientist. When people go, shh, don't tell anybody. It's like, <laughs> it's what? the virus doesn't keep secrets. <laughs> you know, you're either putting yourself or other people at risk or you're not. Right. So if you feel that you're comfortable six feet away from your neighbors, and you're washing your hands and your due diligence and is I'm there. And I'm happy not to finally share my wine and my uh, cheese yes. with my neighbors. Because, you know, they're all... You're happy to they're not all, share. They all take my good wine. You're so cheap. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're awesome. Hey, uh, you want to know what else is awesome? Uh, ConquerCovid.ca. That's my column this week. Uh, Haley Wickenheiser and a team of 
uh, business leaders and philanthropists. Uh, Ryan Reynolds is a part of it. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many people that are jumping on board. ConquerCovid.ca. Go to the website, check it out. If you can't afford to give, that's totally cool. You can afford to share. That's the point of my column. Go to the orca.ca, read the middle, because what they're what they're doing and how they're doing it, it it's what makes us Canadian in a pandemic, and cool. it's it's pretty good. Yeah, highly pretty recommend good. reading all of your columns for that matter. Well, thank you, George Affleck. <laughs> and of course, our Twitter accounts are George underscore Affleck and at Jody with a Y Vance and at Unspun Podcast. And can you just tell Amanda, our executive producer, that I miss her terribly? I can't <laughs> wait till we're in the same room and bringing it full circle. Rhubarb is almost in season and we need rhubarb gin again. <laughs> I will let her know. I will and on that her. note, adios amigo. Bye.